Hey friends, welcome back. Here's a fun head scratcher for you. How did peacocks get their elaborate tails? If you're watching this in the 21st century, there are two main ideas as to how this happened, each with their own problems. The first is the handicap principle. This theory posits that male peacocks signal their fitness to potential mates by showing off that they can survive despite the handicap of a burdensome tail. The problem here, however, is that this fails to explain why the tail is beautiful. The male peacock could also handicap itself by developing a tail lump or maiming itself. The second theory is that greater ornamentation signals better gene expression to potential mates. However, this would suggest a convergence toward a single standard of beauty. For example, red heads indicating better genes than golden heads or vice versa. This fails to explain the great ornamental diversity amongst birds, especially those from a common ancestor. So we see that adaptionist natural selection is limited in explaining beauty. Our book today, The Evolution of Beauty, argues that there is a second, completely different engine of natural selection that was actually proposed by Darwin himself. This second engine is called aesthetic selection, where the fittest win by seduction not by battle. I find this really exciting because it gives us a whole new framework to understand the forces that shape our world. For example, if you want to explain why new products in the marketplace are always evolving, you could think of it as an adaptive king of the hill or an aesthetically seductive dance between producers and consumers. So to get to aesthetic selection today, we'll be connecting five superstar ideas that build on one another. Let's crack into it. Number one, subjective preferences. Our first star idea is subjective preferences on top of objective preferences. While it's obvious that all animals prefer stuff that objectively aid their genetic survival, such as food or shelter, it's less clear whether they have the cognitive capacity to fancy something just because, like we humans do with fashion. Applied to the mating game, we may have objective preferences for mates with health and resources, but subjective preferences over personality or sense of humour. Notice that because subjective preferences are arbitrary, they aren't shared across the whole population and can be for many kinds of display traits. For example, there are many different ways for a mate to have a great personality than for them to have great health. Looking back to our example of the peacock, we can see that our current understanding of natural selection is very skewed toward objective attraction. We somehow start by thinking that peahens hyper-rationally optimize for their genetic survival when selecting a mate, even more so than us humans. So for now, let's assume that animals also have subjective preferences and see whether or not that takes us to the peacock's tail. Number two, mate choice. Mate choice is important because subjective preferences only matter if we can choose the mates that we prefer. This is actually not all that common in the animal kingdom. For example, in baboons, lions, and hippos, females are forced to mate with the alpha male of the group because the alpha male both chases off other potential suitors and kills the offspring that don't belong to them. In contrast, female birds tend to have more mate choice because males are unable to chase rivals away or overpower females. Coupled with the fact that males for most species really want to be chosen as mates because they don't help to parent offspring, this means that males are forced to attract females by seduction. One way they do this is to charm the subjective preferences of females, which was our first building block from before. The mallard duck is a good example of these opposing mating strategies. Mallard drakes are pretty bipolar. Some respectfully caught females, while others try to forcefully mate with them. Either way, males benefit greatly from mating because they don't help with their parenting and get to propagate their genes for free. If you are siding with the female ducks on this one, the good news is that they are surprisingly good at fending off aggressive males. This forces male drakes with mating aspirations to charm females through aesthetic displays such as mating dances and plumage. Quick pause. Hey everyone, thanks for watching and if you're enjoying it so far, 
please be sure to hit the like button below. I really appreciate it and it helps the channel grow. My goal is to bring to you a constellation of the best ideas so you can create your own by connecting the dots. If you're new here, do subscribe and click the bell. Thanks for watching once again and let's move on to the next one. Number three, runaway selection. Runaway selection starts with genetic diversity across display traits and subjective mating preferences. Let's say we have a population of birds. Some have short tails and some have long tails. Of these, some prefer shorter tails and some prefer longer tails. What's going to happen is that birds that prefer longer tails will mate with birds with long tails and birds that prefer shorter tails will mate with birds with short tails. Over time, co-evolution of display traits and subjective preferences would cause the population to diverge into two distinct groups. One preferring longer tails and having long tails and another preferring shorter tails and having short tails. Take the long-tailed widow bird. It's quite clear that its tail, measuring about 20 inches, is abnormally long and quite likely to be maladaptive. One theory is that a long time ago, when their tails were a regular length of say 5 inches, there was some adaptive benefit to having a longer tail, let's say up to 10 inches. Hence, adaptive selection would have selected for birds with longer tails as well as birds that preferred longer tails, creating a whole new force of sexual selection. With this, what started out as an objective preference for longer tails can overshoot the adaptive optimum, as females who prefer males with longer tails would pick a male with an 11 inch tail over a male with a 10 inch tail, which was the optimum as we mentioned before. Hence, mating preferences and display traits can run away from the adaptive optimum, reaching a new equilibrium once the display trait is too maladaptive to increase any further. From this, we see that species can change solely on the basis of aesthetic preferences, so much so that it overpowers adaptive pressures. Number four, aesthetic radiation. You probably know the story of how Darwin discovered adaptive selection by studying the Galapagos finches. He realized that they were very similar, but had an array of distinctive traits that were functionally adapted to eating different kinds of foods. Today, we call this adaptive radiation. However, in nature, we also see aesthetic radiation, where entire families of birds have an array of ornamental traits with little adaptive purpose. A good example of this is the mannequin family, which has 60 different species of these cute fellas. All mannequins are largely similar except for ornamental differences. One may be red-headed and another may be golden-headed, one is white-bibbed and another is white-bearded. Given the diversity of ornamental displays, it seems more reasonable to suggest that these traits were selected for by subjective preferences, instead of a white bib being more adaptively optimal in some situations and a white beard more optimal in others. This, combined with mate choice, likely resulted in runaway selection of traits across an array of arbitrary axes. Simply a group of females preferring males with white bibs and another group of females preferring males with white beards. And so we have a full framework for the evolution of beauty, where aesthetic radiation is due to runaway selection across different axes of subjective preferences enabled by mate choice. Number five, beauty matters. Now we have a fuller picture of natural selection, which includes both adaptive and aesthetic selection. With this, we can see how beauty can happen, even if it is useless or even harmful. In other words, beauty matters. This should come as no surprise, since most beautiful things in our lives have little use. Art, fashion, and fine dining are all luxuries that aren't useful relative to their cost. For example, there are good reasons why you may prefer a $2,000 designer gown over a $50 mass market dress stemming from subjective preference and mate choice. The designer gown may speak to your subjective preference and make you feel special, or you may be attending a formal party and want to be accepted by others. Either way, choosing the designer gown is likely to be an aesthetic decision instead of an adaptive, functional one. 
So we see that both aspects of natural selection are important. Adaptive selection explains objective domains, such as process innovation in business, superbugs in medicine, or economic cooperation amongst people. Aesthetic selection works better for subjective domains, such as luxury markets, romantic attraction, and cultural norms. Applied to our lives, this is a good reminder to exercise empathy. If you want something from others, better to charm them than to force them. Also, aesthetic radiation drives home the point that all forms of beauty have merit along their own subjective axes, just as the white bib mannequin is no better than the white bearded mannequin. The diversity of beauty across cultures is something to be appreciated, not compared. So that's about it for the video. Thanks for watching and if you enjoyed it, please remember to hit the like button and subscribe. I really appreciate it and it helps the channel grow. My goal is to bring to you a constellation of the best ideas so you can create your own by connecting the dots. Thanks again and I'll see you in the next video.